Um, as I began, I should admit to being a bit uh, two-faced on the topic. Um, when I'm speaking to or writing for an uh, audience that's kind of new to water marketing, I tend to be um, extremely positive, optimistic, because I really do think that there's a lot that can be accomplished. On the other hand, when I'm talking to a group of economists, I tend to counsel care. Um, economists have a lot of almost religious zeal about marketing anything and think that basically it's a, a good thing and therefore tend to underappreciate under -appreciate some of the oddities that exist with respect to water that uh, really do need to be respected. So um, my sense of things is that you're group one um, and uh, uh, therefore you know what you're going to get from me. Um, I'm going to be pretty positive about uh, water marketing and what it has to um, um, offer. Um, and so what I'd like to do is uh, uh, provide a few basics and then uh, make my way into some Texas experiences. And I think I have more material than I have time, so I'm probably going to have to keep an eye on the, uh, uh, the boss here and he might have to cut me off at um, some point in time. Uh, Texas has a lot of experience with water marketing and there's a lot of different things that we could talk about there. Uh, just a few uh, basics um, in terms of uh, setting up a water market. Um, you just need a, uh, a few things. Um, my, my little bit of knowledge about how things are conducted in Okanagan makes me think that you've already made a couple of these steps. Uh, first thing you have to do is um, set aside some water that you're not going to market. Um, this is akin to if you were going to have land marketing, which you do, um, set aside some land that is crown land and not to be marketed, and the rest you're going to market. Um, and the second step is to take what it is you're going to market and divvy that up as property rights and let everybody know how much they have individually and proceed to uh, meter and make sure that people don't trespass on other people's water rights, that sort of thing. Um, to label those water rights as transferable then, I believe that's a step that you have not made uh, anywhere in the province. Um, to market, we need to allow transferability and subsequently oversee transactions. So proposed transactions uh, then go before some sort of uh, oversight committee um, with an involved bodies of rules uh, that will determine whether or not the transaction is allowed to occur, uh, trying to account for third party effects, what we technically call um, externalities in most, most cases. So. Um, uh, that's the general sort of thing. Why? Um, basically, we're trying to create a signal, um, a signal that people receive and therefore alters their behavior. It's very difficult to cajole people into doing the right thing with respect to um, water use. Um, and in part, that's because it's so hard to determine what the right thing actually is. People are different. The uses to which they put water are different. How they feel about those uses are different. Firms and businesses experience different um, conditions regarding their water use. They're growing different crops on different soils with different slopes. They have all kinds of different alternatives that are available to them. And if you're going to try to regulate that in some sort of command and control system, it's very hard to do because the public authority is not in possession of the specialized information that's necessary to do that sort of thing. Um, basically what I'm saying is that all water conservation is not good conservation, because basically all f interesting forms of water conservation involves the substitution of other valuable resources for water or the loss of water value in some way. So there's a difficult um, balance to strike among these things. And again, this is very particularized because different people face different conditions. Okay, so what we, what we do in water marketing or what we're able to achieve in water marketing is have a signal that everybody can respond to and seeing what the value of water is. I dare say that based on what I know in the Okanagan, nobody faces a value for water. I, don't, I, I know of no condition where anybody actually faces a value for the raw water that goes into the water that you receive. 
basically everybody who's paying for water in the Okanagan seems to be paying for the value added that was necessary uh, to be paid to transport, clean, store, whatever, to get that water to their house or their farm. Okay, there's no actual value paid for the base resource itself. And when water is scarce, that is socially wrongful, and that is something that water marketing can make some strides in correcting. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of like if you were buying a house but didn't have to pay for the lumber that went into the house. You know, well, what would happen? Well, people would demand two houses, house, too many houses. Houses would be too cheap. You know, same, sort of, same sort of thing. All right. So that's the reason why in terms of water marketing. Okay. Some of the basic achievements uh, that you get when you have water markets. Um, this is a relatively short list. Uh, short list. I'm just going to mention some prime things. Uh, your list might be longer. Uh, water isn't stuck in low-valued activities. Right? And high-valued activities aren't stuck without water. It's allowed to move. Uh, growth is enabled, not any kind of growth, good growth. The growth that is in tune with the level of water scarcity that exists in a region, which might be variable. Water supply development is curtailed. In a modern era of water scarcity in many jurisdictions, water supply development is a very expensive undertaking. Um, it's oftentimes environmentally malicious as well. So typically this is a good thing. Right. The value of water gets revealed. It's a nice thing to know. Right now for the Okanagan, we don't know it. We don't have evidence regarding what the value of water might be. And knowing that is, is useful for other policy mechanisms that can be introduced as well. Okay. Uh, Texas, uh, in the United States, we think of it as a big place. British Columbia goes, oh, wow, that's small. Um, uh, Texas, about uh, three quarters the size of uh, British Columbia. Um, you can see our river basins generally are flowing in this direction to the uh, Gulf of uh, Mexico. We have a couple river basins that flow uh, to the east and are eventually tributary to the uh, Mississippi. Um, very diverse state in terms of water at this end of the state. It's real dry, eight inches of rainfall a year, uh, can't grow much of anything. Uh, at the other end of the state, this end of the state, uh, 56 inches of rainfall per year. Uh, it's a meter and a half for the nerds. Um, we've got uh, at this, at the wet end of the state, uh, a couple hundred thousand acres of rice. Um, so, you know, a wet kind of thing going on there. Uh, so we've got a lot of diversity in the state. Um, we've got borders with three other states. We have uh, interstate agreements with all of those states whereby we know how much water they get, how much we get. So we've split the water resources there. It's good for us to know. That's basically a cre precursor for water marketing. In order to give water market, uh, water rights away, you've got to know how much you've got. Right. Um, we've got a long border with the nation of uh, Mexico. That border is a river, um, the Rio Grande River. Uh, there is a treaty between the United States and, uh, and, and uh, Mexico, as there is between the United States and Canada, splitting this water resource. And we know how much the United States gets, which is all Texas, by the way, clearly, and, uh, and how much is Mexico's. Okay.